All right. Thank you all so much for attending this evening to discuss the Army Corps of Engineers Coastal Texas study and its coastal barrier system proposed for Galveston Bay. My name is Jordan Maka. I'm the executive director for Bayou City Waterkeeper, and we work throughout the lower Galveston Bay watershed to protect and restore our waterways that flow into Galveston Bay. Tonight's webinar is hosted by Bayou City Waterkeeper, Galveston Bay Foundation, Healthy Gulf, and Turtle Island Restoration Network. We're all here tonight because the Corps Feasibility Study and Environmental Impact Statement are currently out for public comment. And there are many lingering questions and concerns regarding the risk to Galveston Bay, the financial and economic cost to our communities, and the effectiveness of its design. Tonight, I'm joined by a stellar panel, Dr. John, er uh, jo Dr. John Anderson, Emeritus Professor of Oceanography at Rice University, Dr. Azure Bevington, coastal ecologist who lives in High Island, Scott Jones, Government and Regulatory Affairs Manager at Galveston Bay Foundation. Joni Steinhaus, Director of the Gulf of Mexico Program for Turtle Island Restoration Network. And Naomi Yonder, Staff Scientist for Healthy Gulf. I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Azure Bevington to get us started. Thank you again for joining us. And oh, as a note, before I forget, if you would like to ask any questions throughout the, the discussion, um, please submit your question in the Q&A box or in the chat, we'll be monitoring both. We're gonna try and make this as uh, conversational as possible. So please uh, feel free to give us your questions and we will answer them as they come up in the presentation. So thank you all so much again for joining us and we well, let's get started. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Jordan, for that wonderful introduction. and. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, I'm gonna just jump right in and give, make sure, there we go. Um, make sure I can change the slide. So um, just an outline of the presentation. And like Jordan said, um, as I'm going through, if you have questions, please just put them in the chat or the Q and A, and we will try to answer them as we're going over that topic. Um, so what I'm gonna do first is, is go over an overview of the plan, the costs, the order of implementation, and then we're gonna get into the concerns. So um, at the end of the presentation, we'll talk about the concerns, the environmental concerns, comparisons to other gate systems throughout the world that have been built, um, and then delays that this could potentially pose to smaller, uh, more easily implemented projects, and then what you can do, you know, how you can help, um, to push for better projects, push for improvements on this project, and request an extension and where you can get more information. So we'll go through some details on that as we go through the talk. Um, so how did we get here? A lot of you have been involved in this for a long time. A lot of you um, understand the devastation that occurred in 2008 from Hurricane Ike. And then in 2009, the Ike Dyke concept was proposed by Professor Bill Merrill from Texas a and Galveston. And this idea was essentially to build a wall to keep surge out of the bay. And, you know, I understand his desire to do that, to protect his city and the surrounding communities. Um, and other options were also presented by the Speed Center and GCC PRD. But they all sort of focused on stopping surge at the coast. And unfortunately, storm surge can't really be stopped at the coast. The surge goes into Galveston Bay. Galveston Bay is an estuarine system where salt water from the Gulf of Mexico and fresh water from various rivers mix. And, you know, that system is designed to and has always undergone storms and storm surge and wash over associated with those. And so it changes the system fundamentally to even propose this. And, and if you were able to do it, which is an extremely tall ask, it, it would be very detrimental to the system. And so in 2014, the U.S. Army Corps initiated this study that, that we're going to talk about today, the Coastal Texas Protection and Restoration Study. And so the, um, the Texas GLO was identified as the non-federal sponsor for the study portion. They will not be the non-federal sponsor for construction of any aspect of this project. Um, and we'll talk more about who the non-federal sponsor will be for the project. And then in 2016, the Army Corps declared its in intent to prepare this draft feasibility study and environmental impact statement. 
And that, those are the reports that are released. Now, the first draft was released in 2018, and to it, it met widespread community opposition. Um, it originally called for levies down Highway 87 and 3005, um, essentially leaving uh, large portions of those beach communities in front of surge levy. And so it was unacceptable to those communities and really just showed, in my opinion, that the Army Corps didn't really understand what, how those communities worked and what the, the value of those communities was and what, you know, and it, so what they did is they went back to the drawing board and I commend them for that. And so they've now released the second draft of the plan. It was released at the end of October. Um, it was released the, the Friday before the presidential election. So a very, very busy week. So if, if you missed it when it was initially released, that is understandable. But um, we now have until December 14th for the public comment period. We are working on trying to get an extension. Numerous people um, requested numerous organizations. These organizations that are hosting this, this webinar have requested an extension and we'll give you information on how you can also request an extension of the comment period. So um, this is the project timeline released by the, the US Army Corps. And so the, um, we are currently here in yellow and this is where we have the, the, the opportunity to make comments on the draft report before it is submitted to Congress for authorization and appropriation of funds in the spring of 2021. So very soon, this will be finalized and sent to Congress. At that point, US Congress would have to authorize the, the study and appropriate the funds for it. And at that point, we would begin um, engineering design and then construction and the soonest that we would see any construction at absolute soonest which is uh, you know very very unlikely with a project of this scale is 2025 to 2028 and the absolute soonest that we would see any flood control structures completed would be 2035 to 2053 and I'll talk about this throughout the presentation as will the other presenters but we need flood protection sooner than that there's a number of, of projects that could be implemented much sooner and at a much smaller scale than this enormous project. I'll go through the timeline and the cost in more detail as, I go, as we go along. So what is this Texas Coastal Protection and Restoration Study? It refers to this draft proposal that was put together by the Army Corps and the Texas General Land Office. And it does focus on the entire Texas coast to some extent. So, on the figure on the right, you can, or I mean, I'm sorry, the figure on the left, you can see that in the, the green squares, these are restoration projects. So there's an enormous amount of coastal restoration of natural areas in the plan, which is, is very sorely needed along the Texas coast. But then in blue are these storm surge protection structures. So these are coastal storm, coastal storm risk management structures. And you can see there's a there's a tiny area in South Padre where they propose beach renourishment for storm protection. But the majority, the vast majority, um, $23 billion of this $26 billion project are located in Galveston Bay and along this upper part of the Texas coast. And so the gate systems alone are $14 billion of that. And the only other flood protection feature in this plan is the South Padre and it's only 60 million. So essentially the project very, very much focuses on the upper Texas coast in terms of storm protection. And this part is often referred to as the coastal barrier. We've, you know, names like the Ike Dyke, um, the coastal spine have also been used. The coastal barrier is the term that the Army Corps uses. And so we basically tried to to use that consistently throughout this, but it refers to similar types of structures where you're building a wall along the coast instead of working with natural processes and how barrier islands and peninsulas actually work. Um, so this coastal barrier system um, is the, by far the largest part of the project. So the stated purpose of the plan and the stated purpose of the study that the Army Corps and the Texas GLO undertook was to identify coastal storm risk management and ecosystem restoration measures that would, and this is important, I, I want to read this directly from the wording that's used in their plan and that, that their purpose was, was to protect the health and safety of Texas coastal communities. 
and to reduce the risk of storm damage to industries and businesses critical to the nation's economy, as well as address critical coastal ecosystems in need of restoration. And all of this, because it, the project is proposed to be undertaken with federal money, must be done in compliance with the National Environmental Policy Act, which is referred to as NEPA, um, N-E-E-N-E-P-A. And so what this law requires is that there be an evaluation of all relevant environmental and community effects of any federally funded project. And this is generally completed for a complex project like this by preparing an environmental impact statement. And so the question comes to, did they achieve these goals? And I, I think that they think they did. I don't think they did, as well as numerous um, conservation organizations. Uh, and, and people along the coast. They have not completed, you know, and looking through this plan, we learn more and more that they have not completed an evaluation of the environmental effects of the proposed project. They talk about doing that in future supplemental environmental impact statements after they receive funding from Congress, but they have not yet done that for the vast majority of this project. They have not provided adequate design detail for the public to comment on the plan or its effect. The proposal actually puts smaller scale flood protection off for many years after an enormous gate system has been designed and built, which in my opinion leaves communities and industry vulnerable to flooding. It does not work to protect the health and safety of Texas coastal communities. And so um, go more into the plan, so if you would like to learn more about this, and we'll have more about this at the end also, but if you're able to screenshot this and then um, Gordon from Bayou City Waterkeeper will make sure to send out um, links to, to information for everyone that's registered. But you can download these reports from coastalstudy.texas.gov, which is the website put together by the US Army Corps. We've also created a zip folder, um, which you can download which makes it a lot easier. There are two large studies, and then there are, oh, 30 or 50 supplemental appendices with information about various aspects of the plan. And so they've been grouped into these folders so you can download these more easily. Um, the total, the studies themselves are um, a little over 400 or 500 pages. The, the environmental impact statement and the feasibility study, and then 5,000 or more pages of supplemental material. Um, so it's an enormous amount of information. It's an enormous project. And so you can also learn more at these, these organizations. These have put together fantastic websites that talk about various aspects of it, that talk about portions of it that are particularly important for, for their members and for the um, focus of their conservation work. Turtle Island Restoration Network, Galveston Bay Foundation, and Bayou City Waterkeeper. And then there's also a Coastal Barrier Information page on Facebook, which you can find just by, by searching for Coastal Barrier Information. And that was a group where we were able to share a lot of information with the initial release, and there's still discussion and sharing of articles in, in that. So if you're, if you're on Facebook, that's a good thing to check out. Um, and then if you if you need more time, if seeing all of this and hearing about the thousands of pages of documents that makes you think you need more time, please, please join us in requesting an extension of the comment period until February 1st, 2021. And at this link, you can um, submit to request a comment period to your elected officials as well as to the U.S. Army Corps and the Texas GLO. And what this will do is allow all of us get a better understanding of this plan and what it actually entails and what, what the effects would be. So with, with the, the cutoff of December 14th, the, you know, during a very busy um, and complex holiday season, when all of us are trying to figure out how we're gonna deal with the pandemic and our families and all of that, um, we need more time. I mean, we need this to go into 2021. The Army Corps actually delayed the release of this plan by almost a month because they weren't ready. Because, you know, like everything else in 2020, everything took longer than they thought it would be. I understand that, but please give us more time. They assured us for years that they wouldn't release this during the holidays again, like they did two years ago. And then they did. And when we ask for an extension, they have not been forthcoming in it. The extension was re originally requested in September when we found out about the delay. 
So please, if you would like more time, please join us in, in talking to your elected officials and re requesting this extension. So now to go into the plan. Um, I'm gonna go through quickly the details of the plan and the components um, in Galveston Bay and around the Galveston Bay area. And then we'll move on to talk about the concerns after I go through this, the structural details. And so um, basically this is, the, this is an image that was created by the US Army Corps. It's a cartoon, it is obviously not to scale. Um, but, it, you know, it's kind of terrifying as is because it really shows you what they see as the most important aspects of this. They don't, you know, you see seawalls that go right to the ends of the island. You see these enormous gate systems and you see condos. Um, and, and so this isn't what myself and I think the other people who live on the coast value about Galveston Bay. They value the natural environment and the beaches and the wetlands that support the fishery and, and other things like this. So, um, you know, just looking at this, this was, the, this is sort of one of the first images you see on their website. So as you go through and learn more about the plan, the Bolivar Road skate system. So this area that where the opening of Galveston Bay is, is referred to as Bolivar Roads. It's a, it's a term that refers to a shipping passage. And so it's basically where the ship channel goes in and out of Galveston Bay. And it's about two miles, just over two miles from Galveston Island to Bolivar Peninsula. And so anyone who's taken the ferry has, has seen that crossing up close. And so this would be built just seaward of where the ferry passage goes. So the ferries would be um, uh, on the Galveston Bay side, and then these gates would be towards the Gulf of Mexico. And so um, it will include, and I'll go through each of, the, of these gates in a little bit more detail, but the sector gates here are what would be on the, the large ship channel passages. There would be smaller sector gates for recreational vessels um, on either side of those. Lift gates. Um, going from Bolivar Peninsula and Galveston Island on either side, shallow water gates, and then it ties into four miles of concrete walls and levees around Port Bolivar and involves deepening this portion of the ship channel. So they'd have to widen this so that they could make two double channels, one in each direction. They would deepen them to 60 feet. The current depth of the ship channel, I think, is 40 or 48 feet. Um, so it would also dramatically change flow patterns in and out of the bay. And we'll talk about that more in the environmental concerns. Um, so the sector gates themselves are 650 feet wide across each of these channels going in either direction. They allow for commercial and, and then recreational vessels uh, through the much smaller ones. But they will be floated in and out, floated out of these, these islands, which will have to be constructed and then filled with water and sunk into the channel when a storm surge is coming. These gates have been used um, multiple places around the world. It's not a new design. Um, they've been used effectively, but they have primarily, I think only ever been used on enclosed reinforced canal. Many miles from the opening, the inlet to the ocean or to the Gulf. And so nothing like this has ever been built on an opening of a bay system that opens directly into a, a large body of water like the Gulf of Mexico. And we'll show you some of those examples later on. And so the vertical lift gates, which would extend on either side of those um, large islands that would be built for the sector gates, are, there are 15 of these gates in total. This is 100 feet tall which is mind boggling to me. And I don't know if you can see this. There's a tiny person on this picture and these are on the Army Corps website. You can actually see them on there too. Um, and so, and, and in the draft reports, but they have, you, you can walk through the images on their website. So this is over nine stories tall. This is enormous. And so when they're open, you would see the entirety of the gate sitting above the water. And then when they're closed, they would go down below the water. And so they'd be lowered before a storm, and then similarly, they would open back up. Following a storm, will sediment be washed up against these? Will that jam the, the hydraulics that need, that need to move up and down? I mean, there's, will debris be trapped? 
I mean, if we get a storm and we have a lot of debris on either side, what will happen to this? And will these, will these be functional? There's a lot of questions that haven't been answered. And so on the other side of these, there's shallow water gates on the Bolivar side. So Bol the, the um, portion just um, west of the end of the Bolivar Peninsula is very shallow, less than six feet deep. So they would use large box culverts with vertical sliding gates inside of them. They'd just be much smaller than the big vertical gates. And so this is an area where, um, if you can see, there's a person walking on here. So this is a much smaller structure. The, the gate would be housed in this portion behind the person walking and then would lower down. But this is an area that experiences a lot of sedimentation. After Ike, this area is still in quite a bit, this whole expanse on this eastern side of the, the channel the opening. So will sediment build up against these culverts once they're closed? I mean, there's a lot of questions. None of the modeling to answer any of those types of questions has, has been done for this study. And, you know, will they open back up? Or will you be stuck with essentially a little jetty that's packed in by sand? I mean, there's so many what ifs about how this will function based on the, the sedimentation and, and hydrodynamics that we experience here. Is, is there a question? I'm sorry. So, and then moving from the gates that are across the mouth of Galveston Bay now to a flood wall. So there is a one mile long, 22 foot high concrete flood wall, which is proposed to run in front of the community of Port Bolivar um, the, on this side of Highway 87. The flood wall would basically be oh, sorry, um, between the community, it's hard to see on this image, this is, this is from the Army Corps website, but this is the North Jetty. This is the, the North Jetty Bait Camp would be on the inland side of the flood wall. The boat launch would also, um, as well as all of the homes. And the Bolivar Flats Shorebird Sanctuary and the extremely productive mud flats and salt marsh in that area would be in front of the flood wall and levee. And so if you look, this is, these are pictures of what this 22 foot high, one mile long concrete flood wall would look like in front of Port Bolivar. So there's actually would be houses here um, on this side of it. And then you would be looking out at open water at North Jetty and then Bolivar Flats. So um, this is something that's extremely problematic for that community that's built around access to the water, um, views of the water and the flats. Um, and then that would tie, so, sorry. That flood wall, that one mile long flood wall would then tie into levees, which is the purple line. Um, so the, the purple line is a 14 foot tall earthen levee. And so it's 14 feet from any VD88, which is a term that's used to, to reference it to a datum, which basically means where zero is. So it's very close to sea, sea level, not exactly sea level, but um, it's 14 feet above about sea level. So if you think about if you're standing on the ground and the ground is about five feet above sea level, then the levee would be about nine. Hey, Azure, um, I have a yeah. quick question about, uh, about the ferry and where it's going to be placed. Um, is it going to run along the, is it going to run, run, be, run parallel to the gates? Yes. Yeah, so you can see on this map, are you able to see my um, cursor, my mouse when I, or are, are you Very not? Very small. Okay, I wish I had a pointer that was better, but unfortunately, so you can see on this map, Highway 87 um, extends out to the, it, it's, it's inland, it's on the Galveston Bay side of this structure. And so the ferries would run behind it. The ferry comes out, um, the, the, the gates tie into Fort Travis. So if you think about where Fort Travis is, and then Highway 87 is north of that, um, you basically are coming out behind it and the ferry would run behind the gate and then go into the ship channel behind Galveston. And so it, it, it wouldn't necessarily impact where the current ferry transit is, I don't think, um, but I'm not positive about that. I'm not, that's not, I'm not that familiar with that aspect of it. But I do know the ferry would be 
inside Galveston Bay behind the gates. So, and then to go into, so going from this levee that would be three miles long along the Bolivar Flat Shorebird Sanctuary, which is an area that's extremely important for migrating birds, for, for, for migrating shorebirds, for habitat, and has salt marshes and mudflats that are resilient to flooding unless they're put in front of a, a levee, in which case they ex would experience um, significant scour, turbulence, and wave action, which could be very, very destructive to the, this habitat. So those levees then would come down um, just before the neighborhood, of the Biscayne neighborhood on Bolivar, and meet with the beach and dune expansion that's proposed. And these beaches and dunes are proposed for both <coughs> Um, 25 miles on the Bolivar Peninsula and oh, I think 17 miles on the West End for the, the length of the West End. And um, it's, it involves an enormous double line of dunes, an expansive beach above the high tide line. So <clears throat> this entire um, expanse is over a football field in width. So from where the current dune line is, so this wouldn't be built on any beach houses, this wouldn't be built on, this would be built from where the current dunes are, or I guess were, or should be. Um, I know there was a lot of erosion from these recent storms, would be built seaward. So it would be a football field's length to what's called mean high, high water, which is the highest tide that you see under normal conditions. So not a storm tide, it, and so even on lower tides, it would be even further to the water. And I love big, huge, expansive beaches, but this is not realistic for this part of the Texas coast. And this is an amount of sand that is just absolutely huge. And it, it's, 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 it's frankly unnecessary for what we need. There are areas of the Texas coast that are eroding rapidly, the Barrier Island and the peninsula. But we need to be judicious and we'll talk more about concerns related to sand availability. We need to be responsible about how we use the sand that we have in areas that are rapidly eroding instead of just building these enormous dunes that wouldn't even be built for 10 to 15 years. We need projects that are more realistic to be built sooner. Um, and then so the other side, so that gets us onto the Bolivar side and also includes the West End of Galveston. The uh, city center of Galveston um, would involve seawall improvement. So the height, the current height of the seawall, I think it's 17 feet. They would raise the height of the sea level to 21 feet by basically building three to four foot curbs on the landward side of Seawall Boulevard. And so this is taken directly from their website, the Army Corps website. They say that they will be similar to these curbs in front of the McGuire Dent Recreation Center. And when you, you know, you go down Seawall sea Boulevard, there's an enormous number of businesses um, and parking lots and drive throughs and restaurants and all sorts of things. There will be an enormous number of gates uh, along this extent. And then those will tie into the Galveston Ring Barrier System. So this is all part of the Galveston Ring Barrier System which is a system of flood walls, gates, pump stations, and levee sections, which will surround this, you know, about 16 square miles of the city of Galveston. Maximum height of this flood wall would again be 14 feet from NAVD 88, which is about 14 feet above sea level. Um, it would include numerous gates across roadways, railways, railways and off its bayou as well as drainage structures and pumping to remove excess water. This is an incredibly complex structure. Um, so you, you know, it's, it's many structures. And so you can see this is also taken from their website. Um, it indicates the different pieces, the different mechanical pieces that would be part of this. You can go there and learn more. I am not an expert in, in levees and flood protection. I am, am a coastal ecologist and I'm much more comfortable in natural environments. Um, but so, so this is something that, you know, this, the residents of the city of Galveston really, I hope, um, get informed and get involved and make sure that, that what's being proposed for their city is something that they're, 
they're comfortable with and that they understand. And I think that's critically important. And I don't think we have enough time to do that during this very short comment period. And I think that um, the, the residents of the, the coastal communities deserve to have more time. So to then go to the Clear Lake gate system. So this, um, this is also not a very clear picture of what this is. Um, but I also took this from the Army Corps website. I wasn't able to get a more clear image. Um, but what this would be is a 75 foot floating sector gate. So it would be open, but it would close over a 75 foot area at the southernmost inlet into Clear Lake. And then there'd be a circulation gate at the northern inlet. And there would be pumping stations for when these gates are closed. And then a flood wall system along 146, just going up to higher elevation areas. A similar system um, at the inlet into Dickinson Bayou um, would be a gate system. This would be a 100 foot wide sector gate at the entrance to Dickinson Bayou with um, pumping stations as well. And this would again tie into higher elevation areas along Highway 146. These are much, much smaller structures and anything um, at the mouth of the bay. Um, and so, and similarly to Galveston, I think these are these are things that these communities need to be aware of, need to get you know involved and get informed on what this looks like, and you know, and and push for their elected officials and re and representatives to make sure that they're getting what they want in terms of flood protection in those communities. And then the last piece of this, which I kind of think should be the first piece of this, is non-structural improvement. And so, what this term, which is not a very you, good term if you're talking about because it's not very clear what it actually is but it really does refer to anything basically that you can do to reduce damage from floods other than building levees and gates so elevating buildings changing building codes um, elevating new construction retrofitting old construction flood proofing businesses regulations um, uh, or you know, building new building codes, like I said, and also, and this is recommended in the plan, but also improving drainage. But this is recommended in this plan, but just for the mainland communities um, up near um, Seabrook and that area. And so, what my question is is, you know, and a number of other people have, why is not this not recommended everywhere? I mean, this is what you do after a flooding event like Harvey, is you to build back higher and better. And this would reduce damage from all types of flooding events. And the US Army Corps and the Texas GLO are very upfront when they're asked about, will this help from a Harvey-like storm? They say that they were not given the directive to do that when they initially were given the study directive in 2014 before Harvey happened. And the fact that they did not pivot in any way, after Harvey is is unacceptable, I think, and you know something that the local communities and the local officials need to be um, pushing for. These 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 if we're going to do flood protection in the coast, we need it all to work together. We need the the measures that will protect from storms like Harvey to work with the measures that protect from storms like I. And so this is actually much less costly. It is not cheap, but it is much, much less costly than $26 billion for gates. And so this is re the, this, this area in blue on the map um, near Seabrook and Laporte that they recommend is about $220 million for that area. And so you could extend this to other communities for much less than the cost of, of a lot of the gate systems and things like that. And a lot of communities are already doing this. This is already happening up in the Bay Area. This is happening on, on Galveston. This is happening on Bolivar. Bolivar was, was devastated by ice and is built back better, higher, and stronger. And I, I really think that this should be a model for how you deal with communities that are located on the coast. You have to accept the realities of that storms are gonna happen. You have to build in a way that you're responsibly dealing with that risk. And so how much will all of this cost? So um, a lot. It'll cost, the entire plan is $26.2 billion. 
Um, that's for everything. That's for the non-structural, that's for ecosystem restoration, that's for all the gates and the, the levees um, and the dunes. And so the Bolivar Roads gate system though is the, the largest piece of that. Just the gates, not what they term the whole coastal barrier, which includes the dunes, but just the gates, the two miles of gates across the opening of Galveston Bay is $14 billion. It's 53% of the total cost. That's enormous. That alone may actually be bigger than any other single project that the US Army Corps has ever done in their entire history. I have to check that. But if, if someone knows, I would like to know because that is enormous. That's, that's just the game. And so what I think is that, you know, and these are based just as a reminder too, is these are based on 2020 construction costs. So by the time they get to these, construction is going to be much more expensive. And so it's only going to increase into the future. Um, you could do, so, you know, looking at the total project costs, looking at the cost of just the gate system, $14 billion, you could do the rest of these for less than half of the total cost of this project. You could, ex you know, you could, you could expand non-structural measures to other communities for a fraction of this that would reduce risks from all types of flooding immediately as soon as that money was made available and also spur economic development because you have to hire companies to do this, you know, flood protection and elevating of homes. Ezra, so I'm gonna interrupt you for a moment. Mm -hmm. So there's a question about the cost on the dunes in this budget. It doesn't okay. seem obvious. Okay, yeah, let's see. Um, is, I have the chat box open, but I'm not seeing it. Can you read the question? Would that... uh, what, where does the co dune cost go in this budget? Oh, so um, I'm not sure. So if you go down the, the list, the Bolivar and West Galveston Beach and Dune System. So it's it's the third one above the total project cost. It's $3.6 billion. And that's for the dunes. Um, both Bolivar and West Galveston. There's also some beach nourishment on South Padre, which is below that, that's $60 million. It's much less, um, it's much less extensive. It requires less sand. So, um, so each of these, uh, sorry if I didn't go through it uh, one by one, but um, so that's a very expensive piece of this as well. And then the Galveston Ring Barrier is $3.3 billion. And, you know, the Clear Lake gate system is $1.5. The Dickinson gate system, which is smaller on one, one um, inlet, is $800. 79 million. These are very expensive projects. So they need to be done right and we need to make sure that this is the type of project that we want to spend that that amount of money on. And I don't think that necessarily the the coastal communities have been aware of the details of this. This idea has been presented conceptually for a number of years, for longer than I've lived in Texas. This concept of let's build a wall and it'll protect everyone and it's a silver bullet solution and it'll save everybody has been touted and that is just not true. You cannot do that. That's not how coastal protections work. And I'll show you some examples around the world and that is not what other countries do. That's not what Louisiana does. Um, you know, we need to look at each of these projects individually and decide if this is something that we want to. For, there are some very good ideas in this plan. There's good projects. They need to be looked at individually, not as one big plan. And honestly, the, the unknowns and the concerns about the gate system, to me, make that a very, very worrisome plan. And so if we go to the next slide, this is the cost sharing. And this is what's important for this area. And I'll go through the order of impl implementation, too, in just a minute. But for the cost sharing, who's actually going to pay for this? The project costs will be split between a federal portion, which is still our money, <laughs> we all pay federal income taxes, and a local non-federal sponsor, which will be responsible for 35% of the construction costs. The local sponsor will also be 
responsible for all of the ongoing annual maintenance costs, which is $131 million per year. That's the estimate from the Army Corps. Um, so who is this local non-federal sponsor? Well, it will not be the Texas GLO, who is currently the non-federal sponsor for the study. And that is because the Texas GLO does not have the power of eminent domain. The non-federal sponsor has to have the power of eminent domain um, in order to build the structures like this. They have to be able to take property. Um, and the GLO does not currently have that and does, is not interested in getting that power, apparently. Um, and I don't really blame them. But um, so there will have to be a new local non-federal sponsor. It could be the entire state of Texas. Um, that's, that is a possibility. Um, or it could be a new regional taxing entity. That is probably a more likely possibility. Um, but it has not been created yet and it has not been determined. It will very likely be determined during the 2021 Texas legislative session. So the legislative session starts in 2021 and it is likely that State Senator Larry Kaler or others are likely to submit a bill to create this taxing entity. So it's critically important that we all pay close attention. Um, a lot of these local representatives in the coastal area have been working on pushing for projects of this type for a long time. I think working towards coastal protection solutions is critically important, but I think that we don't have enough input and detail about what these projects are to go ahead with the largest gate system ever built on the face of the earth. I think we need to learn more and we need to be more realistic with our money and our protection. So look at, this is the U.S. Army Corps' proposed order of implementation. So this is taken directly from their website. You can go to the Texas Coastal Study.gov, I don't something like that, and you can look at this. And it is measured in years after congressional funding is appropriated. So at the absolute soonest, this would be 2023. That's when they would get money if it was appropriated right away. It's very, very unlikely that funds would be appropriated right away. That is very rare. There are projects that the Army Corps has designed that have been waiting 40 years for funding. But there are also projects that have gotten funding in less than two years. And so it, it, that is a possibility. As soon as it goes to Congress, Congress could decide, authorize it and appropriate funds at any time. And so we would just be sitting and waiting for them to do that. But once that happens, the Army Corps has said they would immediately focus on the Bolivar Road gate system. So in year one, after they get money, they would start working on and designing the Bolivar Road gate system. It wouldn't be until year nine or 10, they would even begin working on the beach and dune system. So if you're here, if you're in Bolivar and you're on the West End and you're like, yay, they're gonna build me these giant, totally unrealistic dunes of my dreams, you're gonna, it's gonna be a little bit. Um, and, you know, South Padre will get their sand right away, but we won't. And you know, that's because they're so enormous. This is incredibly difficult. This is not normal beach nourishment that we see on the Texas coast. And so, you know, mitigation for the, mitigation is what they need to do where they need to restore natural areas for what they destroy. It's different than ecosystem restoration, which would also start right away, which I think this is, this is good. There's numerous areas that need restoration um, in natural areas along the Texas coast. That's critically important for all sorts of, you know, for, for fishing and for recreation in our area. And then the, the ring levy and the gate systems would not, they would not start for, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten years. This, to me, is maybe the worst part of this plan. The, you know, they're putting off a lot to focus on these gate systems that are clearly their number one priority, but they're putting non-structural improvements, which are cheap and easy and really provide protection from all types of flooding very rapidly last. So they don't have that even starting until 14 years after funds are appropriated. That should be first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was just going to uh, just pitch in that, you know, we've seen non-structural improvements uh, on Bolivar um, after we've seen them on the west end and we've seen them on the west shoreline of Galveston Bay, so we know they can work. 
Yeah, we've seen them and people are already doing them without being provided with this funding from um, this type of a project. And if we were able to stimulate this type of work, it would happen much more rapidly. It would stimulate the local economies. It would provide protection from all types of flooding. It could be done immediately. And this, this alone that they left this to last shows me that they do not have the coastal communities welfare in mind. This is easy and cheap compared to the rest of this. And it should absolutely be first. There's no excuse whatsoever for that not to come first. And so, you know, I think, you know, I'm gonna keep reiterating the, the projects that I think are more important from a coastal, from, for the coastal environments and for the coastal communities where I live and work are these smaller scale projects that can provide protection with less environmental impact, less environmental damage, closer to the communities that need protection, and in a way that those communities can um, be a part of it and understand what the project is at a scale that is reasonable from a cost perspective. I mean, $26.2 billion in the state that our economy is in, in the state that our, you know, workforce is in and industries are in is is absurd. We need to focus on these smaller scale projects that can provide flood protection sooner. And this gate system does not need to be the number one priority for flood protection in the upper Texas coast. So um, I'll go through a little bit. I'm going to hand over to for environmental impacts in just a moment. But um, so I did talk about this a little bit earlier. The environmental impacts have not been fully studied. The Army Corps is very upfront about this acknowledge that they have not completed the, the needed environmental impact studies um, and that they plan to do with what is called a tiered NEPA approach, which means after they get funding from Congress, then they'll do additional environmental impact statements and additional environmental impact studies. And then we'll be able to know the full impact of these projects that they have proposed and gotten authorization from Congress for. And so there will be far less leeway in what we're able to say. There will be public comment periods when those supplemental EISs are released, but this entire project will have been sent to Congress as it is. And what we need is for these projects to be looked at individually and funds to be appropriated in a way that um, is, is responsible to the communities that, that, are, that they're protecting. And so you can see on this table, this is also taken from the um, executive summary of the feasibility study, everything in green are projects that are considered actionable, which means that they've determined they will not have environmental, significant environmental negative effects. Everything in red, they have not done the studies yet. And what that means is they're setting a plan with none of the studies completed. And this is not what NEPA was designed to do. National Environmental Policy Act was designed so that the community could have involvement and make decisions about effects of these projects on their local environment and on the local community. And so th there's a lot of issues with the level. We, we don't have a lot of information on what the environmental effects of this will be. We know that it will change the bay drastically. We know that it will affect local environments, but we don't have the studies to show what that will be because they have not been done, even though they are required to by federal law. So um, uh, we, we know that there will be effects on fishery. So if you're changing the circulation patterns in the bay, if you're putting gate structures, you're changing the velocity that the water's moving through the, the inlet to the bay, and you're changing the turbulence and you're changing the pattern of water movement at all depths. And the Army Corps has done very, very basic studies of particle tracking models, which simulate to some degree, not very well, the movement of fish and shellfish larvae. So basically floating, you know, tiny microscopic floating baby fish and baby shrimp and crabs. And the results are extremely limited. They have not really been adequately reviewed by fisheries biologists. They don't appear to simulate 
known responses of shellfish larval transport and recruitment from you know scientists that are experts in those fields that I've spoken with. And so none of the effects um, on adult fish or adult shellfish movement in and out of the bay have been studied. None of the effects on oysters have been studied, um, despite clear recommendations from state and federal agencies to do so. And so there's been no studies on the effect of the gates on the economic viability of the commercial and rec recreational fisheries. So if you're changing fish populations, you're affecting fishery. You're affecting the commercial fisheries, the economic value of that. You're affecting the recreational fisheries. You're affecting take limits and changes that the regulatory agencies have to put in place to manage those fisheries. And there's an enormous amount of work going on trying to manage flounder um, numbers in Galveston Bay. Flounder are dec decreasing in, in Texas Bay systems and an enormous amount of work is going towards that. N there's no information about how this will affect flounder movement in and out of Galveston Bay. And that alone, to me, I mean, there's so many people who could not make an, a, a comment about this because they, they're not being given enough information for the things that they care about. Um, so, nor has the effect on other large protected species like dolphins and turtles been studied. Um, there's also inadequate protections for threatened and endangered birds and habitat. So um, I talked a little bit about the Bolivar Flat Shorebird Sanctuary. There's, a, there's um, rookery islands throughout the bay. There's all sorts of areas that would be impacted by this. I'll let Scott Jones with Galveston Bay Foundation talk a little bit also about their concerns about the environment of Galveston Bay. Yeah, thank you, Azure. So, you know, when we commented on the uh, original uh, version <clears throat> of the draft feasibility report and environmental impact statement, we certainly noted that there wasn't enough uh, studies being done on these important species. And, and as Azure mentioned, we we're not really that much further. We've got some particle track modeling that tries to model what may happen to juvenile or larval and larvae and eggs. But um, we don't have enough studies yet. And what's so important is this bay is so important. And, and we're talking about livelihoods. We're talking about culture. We're talking about a big economic driver in both the recreational and commercial fisheries, which account for a third of the fishing activity, both commercial and on the recreational side in the whole state of Texas. So this bay is extremely important and to not have the information we need on what may happen to populations of red drum and uh, spotted sea trout or speckled trout and the brown and the white shrimp, the crab, you know, the Corps is asking a, for us to accept a lot and, you know, to come back and talk, talk to us in the future um, about what studies they've done. And so that, that's a big problem. Um, and so we really need folks to, to comment on the importance of these fisheries for those different reasons, financially, culturally, uh, you know, and certainly for the recreation and quality of life. Thank you, Scott. Yes, I agree. And um, I did see one question that came up in here. I'm sorry if I'm missing some of them as I'm talking, but um, about has there ever been another tiered NEPA process on a project this large? I actually am a member of the community working groups, which were created after the outcry in 2018, because they weren't letting the community know what they were up to. And so I was a number of um, representatives from all these conservation organizations, as well as other elected elected officials and just you know community community leaders and other community members are parts of those. And I asked that question in one of those when they said they were going to do this tiered NEPA, and they told me that the only the other project of this scale was the Everglades Restoration Project, which is a restoration project to put the Everglades back. It's, I, I don't know a ton about the details of it. I am pretty familiar that with the, the ecological need and it's to restore flows and limit nutrient inflow into the, the Everglades. But it's an enormous, it was, I think at the time it was $8 billion um, and that was 10 or 15 years ago. Um, it's an enormous pro project, and it was done under a tiered NEPA approach, but it wasn't floodgate across an entire bay system. It wasn't anything like this, where the project is causing enormous environmental change from, you know, 
the, the natural system or, you know, not completely natural, obviously, um, there's definitely human influence, but from the system we currently have. And so nothing like this, to my knowledge, has been done with a tiered NEPA approach. And I asked them, and if, you know, the Army Corps answered with that, um, it, only the Everglades had been done this way. So um, other people I know are more familiar with, you know, regulatory policy stuff may know more, but to my knowledge, that's the only other one. Um, and so I will go ahead and let um, Naomi Yoder from uh, Healthy Golf talk about the, some more of the environmental concerns with this project. Great, thanks Azure. Can you hear me okay? Okay, great. Uh, so I wanted to go over some of the changes in uh, the water flow um, that is projected right now. And of course, there are many more studies that need to be done. Um, and that's the main point is that we need a lot more information before we can even evaluate this project. Uh, and the core with tiered NEPA is not providing that. Uh, so one of the things that we're concerned about is um, changes to tidal amplitude. Uh, that will affect salinity. It will affect um, different types of salinity that make it to the marshes. Uh, so they've modeled changes in the tidal prism which is a fancy term for the volume of water that moves in and out of the bay with the tides. The, the new plan uh, with the sector gates limits water exchange uh, through the tides by about 6%. That might not seem like much, but that's uh, a lot. That, that's enough to um, starve a marsh um, and a shrimp fishery, for example. Uh, there will also be changes in the tidal range because of this. So uh, the, the tidal range will shrink uh, by up to 7%. The tidal range is um, the amount between high tide and low tide. So there will be a smaller range, um, which is also a big problem for the salt marshes uh, and for all of the fisheries. Um, so salt marshes depend on high tides and inundation frequency. So it's not only the, the amount of water, but this happening on a regular basis. Um, the Corps estimates that um, over a thousand acres of marshes will be impacted. Uh, and their solution for what to do about that is, is not um, protecting those marshes in the first place, uh, but trying to use other marshes um, as a surrogate for restoration, uh, which is not adequate. Um, in addition to that, some of their modeling is based on uh, the rosy picture of sea level rise, which um, is not recommended. Um, at the very least, they should use a, an intermediate level, a, a middle range uh, to analyze this. Uh, next slide. Okay, so there will also be changes to uh, water velocity around the gate structures. Um, we know that velocity will change um, right around the, the gate pillars. Uh, and you can see this in, you, there's a series of dots um, in right here. In, um, yeah, thanks, Azure. Um, <laughs> uh, just going across exactly where um, the structure will be. So those will form eddies. They will form um, differences in velocity that will be very difficult for larval species and, and other things, larger species too, to navigate. Uh, the, the wind and freshwater flooding effects such as a uh, flood from a Harvey type event are not accounted for. Uh, and somebody asked a question about this earlier and it's, it's very important that we give the core feedback on that, that that's, that's not accounted for and, and it doesn't seem like um, they've, they've analyzed that at all in this $26 billion project. Uh, 
Uh, next slide. Okay, so uh, as I was saying, the bay depends on water exchange uh, from the tides and the freshwater inputs. Um, all of the modeling runs that they use for this uh, stage of the analysis were with the gates open. We have serious concerns about what happens when the gates are closed and when there are malfunctions with the gates that keep the gates closed for longer than intended. So um, even in the open position, <laughs> we have this change of tidal range uh, and tidal prism. If the gates were to be closed um, repeatedly, let's say, such as if we had a, a Hurricane Laura and Delta situation that happened in Galveston Bay, um, those gates would need to be closed twice in a very short amount of time and we would have uh, sediment, salinity, and oxygen all being impaired um, if, if that happened. So that kind of frequency of closure is not evaluated um, in terms of just the water quality. Um, other countries have similar gates, um, none of this combination and of this scale. Uh, and for those other countries, <laughs> there are some gate systems that are much smaller, um, but that have to be opened even up to once a day to maintain um, their position and their ability to close and open. That is unacceptable. Um, as we said before as well, um, where would the water go um, in a freshwater storm or a Harvey-like flood? Um, if the gates were closed, uh, which presumably they would have been uh, for Hurricane Harvey, if this were built, the water would have to go somewhere. And so San Luis Pass is probably the, the first place. Um, Rollover Pass, which is closed, could cut. Um, so none of these effects have been accounted for. The only evaluation of San Luis Pass is um, for a storm surge gate, and that was deemed not um, appropriate. So we definitely want that as well, uh, some kind of evaluation of where would the water go, the fresh water. Next slide. So we, as we said before as well, turbulence um, and velocity right around the gate structures will be a factor. Um, pollutants as well is very concerning. Um, the core in the DEIS says that the coastal barrier is expected to impact or impair water and sediment quality throughout the Galveston Bay system because it would reduce flushing and mixing of pollutants that enter the bay. Uh, so the bay functions right now as a pollution filter almost. Um, certainly that would be impaired. Um, also the construction time for the, the gates is about 15 years. So what happens to uh, the water quality during that time? That's a long time. That's enough time to uh, kill off shrimp and oyster fisheries, for example. And you know, what about dolphins? What about other fish species? What about any other species that might be relying on that salinity uh, and freshwater exchange. Um, okay, next slide. Great, I think we're going to hand it over um, back to Azure or on to Dr. Anderson to talk some about the sand and, and sediment concerns. Okay. Uh... I don't see the video, but that's all right. You don't need to look at me. Um, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, I was asked to speak about the issue of sand availability for this project. Obviously, uh, this is a large, far, by far larger than any nourishment project than, than, than Texas has ever 
attempted in any, other, any place else that I'm aware of. <laughs> what we see here are the estimates of the amount of sand that would be required to construct this uh, dual dune system along the west end of Galveston Island, that be about 17 million cubic yards uh, on the Bolivar Dune system, about 22 million cubic yards. Then you have to nourish that because we're still going to continue to get erosion. The erosion today, erosion rates along this stretch of coast vary a lot, but on average they're between two and three feet per year. And they're, they're undoubtedly going to increase with time as they have been in the past. Uh, as the rate of sea level rise increases. So um, it's probably a pretty realistic uh, a, a minimal number to say that uh, we're looking at about 60, a little over 60 million cubic yards. You've all ordered a cubic yard maybe of topsoil or sand and had, had the dump truck put it in your yard. You, you've got a feeling for when you talk about 60 million of those, uh, that's a lot of sand. Now the questions that exist uh, in this regard are, uh, where's that sand gonna come from? And based on the studies that have been done to date, uh, most of the sand that is available in this quantity, these quantities, is gonna come from some distance offshore, typically more than 20, 30 kilometers offshore, uh, 20, 30 miles offshore. That means that sand is gonna be quite expensive and that's why you come up with this $3.6 billion figure that is needed to, uh, to mine that sand or, 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 or gather that sand for beach nourishment. And of that, the, the sources that have been identified thus far, as we'll talk about in just a second here, are some of the larger, or, or includes large river deltas and valleys that occur offshore. Uh, sand banks and shore face sands. Um, again, they're all going to take, with the exception of the shore face sands, which have reasons I'll mention later, I would rule out, are going to be very costly because they're going to require hopper dredge to go out and collect those sands. In terms of what we know, uh, that's uh, in, the, in the state of Texas. Uh, there has been, we're fortunate because there have been several academic institutions that have been conducting uh, research in the Gulf for decades now. So we have a fairly good database to fall back on. And, and in the last decade, there's been a couple of uh, in, uh, consulting reports that have primarily relied on that data set to try to come up with uh, estimates of the volumes of sand that are out there. However, I would caution that that those estimates are, are at best guesses, <laughs> given what we know. The other thing that we're fortunate is about is that there continues to be research into looking at offshore sand resources uh, that are including the GLO and, and Texas, uh, Texas universities, uh, BOM, uh, who are looking at sand resources offshore. So can you forward the next slide, please? Whoever, great. So um, bottom right there is our research vessel at Rice, the Lone Star, which no longer is operational, but for about 10 years allowed us to go out and collect data out in the shelf. And one of the things that we were able to do was map out some of these large deltas that occur out on the continental shelf uh, that are shown in the slide on the upper right here. Um, the yellow there are what we estimate to be sands, the, the sand bodies associated with these deltas. That's based on the seismic character. These, these maps are based largely on seismic data. And so when we look at those, those are actually sizable features. I mean, if you compare them to Bolivar Peninsula and Galveston, you certainly can, can appreciate that that there's a lot of sand. And at the bottom there, on the left, is actually a seismic section. And in yellow, I've sort of shaded in what is interpreted based on the seismic character to actually be sands uh, that, that would be on the order, in this case, of about 12 to 15 feet thick. So when you calculate the volumes here, they're actually up in the, you know, uh, millions of 
square of, of cubic meters. So we are talking about large bodies of sand. The one that is closest, the delta that is closest to the coast is the Colorado Delta. It's a younger delta, and so that's why it's closer. As sea level rose, it, it was formed later on as sea level was rising. And what you see there is actually a, a, a contour map or a, a thickness map of the sands within that delta. And so if we, in fact, interpreted the seismic corrective correctly, uh, there's enough sand there to, to undertake a project of this magnitude. But that's a big if. I mean, again, uh, we have some cores that actually have collected sand. I think one of the really positive things here is that that's actually sand that is somewhat coarser than the sands that exist on our beach today. So that means our beaches would actually be more stable, be more attractive, or like Florida, Alabama beaches than what we have today if, if we were able to, to actually use that sand. Next slide. The other, uh, the other source of sand uh, that's uh, been proposed is, are these river valleys that occur offshore. And the slide on the right there shows the old Trinity River Valley uh, as it extends through Galveston Bay and offshore, and then it also shows the Sabine River Valley, and those, those two actually merge about 30, 40 miles offshore into one large valley. So when sea level is lower, and 20,000 years ago, sea level was about 300 feet lower than it is today when the ice sheets were at their maximum size. So these rivers extended all the way out to the edge of the continental shelf, nearly 100 miles uh, south of where they extend today. And, and as they did, they cut their valleys down. They down cut their valleys. Then as sea level rose in the last 20,000 years, these valleys were backfilled initially with river deposits, which are largely fluvial sands. Uh, and then as sea level rose more, they became bays. Uh, Ancestral Sabine Lake and Galveston Bay. And they were backfilled with these bay sediments uh, that are not good for nourishment. These are mostly fine-grained silts and clays. The dotted areas here are actually old tidal inlet deposits that are, our sand, that are believed to be dominantly sand. And you can see there are several locations out there where we've identified these tidal deposits, potentially sand bodies, which would be fairly, again, large sand bodies. Otherwise, we can assume from our work, uh, particularly in Galveston Bay, where we've been able to collect long borings, and that's what the slide in the lower right shows, of the figure in the lower right. And that figure, that's a cross section that goes right up the axis of Galveston Bay that's using these drill cores that we collected. Uh, the yellow and the orange there, are the yellow is sand, but you can see that sand's buried about uh, 30, to so, 30 or so feet below mud, which is the green, the olive green and the gray. Uh, so those incised valleys are not full of sand. That's the key point here. There are isolated sand bodies, but to date, relatively little work has been done on actually sampling those to look at the quality of the sand. Now, with that said, there is an ongoing study by the University of Texas Institute of Geophysics headed up by Dr. John Goff, and it's, uh, they are uh, collecting data and looking at those sand deposits. Next slide. The third uh, sand resource that's been proposed for these massive beach nourishment projects are the sand banks that occur offshore, mainly at East Texas and over in Louisiana the largest of which is Sabine Bank. And in the late 90s, we actually did a study at Rice in, on Sabine Bank, collected quite a bit of seismic data, and we collected a fair number of cores. And what we found is that the top, only the top of the bank is, is actually sand, the upper three meters or so. Uh, but given the area of the bank, that's, that's again, a fairly large volume of sand that's you know, could be used 
for beach nourishment. Now, when I talk about all these things, I, I want to make, I, I should back up and say, we haven't even, no one's actually considered, to my knowledge, the env environmental impacts of dredging the upper eight or 10, uh, you know, eight or 10 feet <laughs> off the tops of these banks. And I think someone may mention that later, but there's, there's a likelihood that these may be unique fisheries habitats, things of that nature. So there's definitely gonna have to be some envir environmental impact studies done to address whether these sand deposits are actually, you know, viable resources. In the case of the deltas, they are buried in a drape of mud. So that, that means they probably don't represent unique fisheries habitats, as is the case for the, for the banks. Next slide. Now, the, the last resource that has been mentioned in these uh, reports that have been generated to date, looking at sand resources offshore Texas, uh, actually calls for potentially uh, collecting sand from the shore face, which the shore face is that area from the low tide mark out to about 25, 30 feet of water. Uh, and again, I think the estimates that are made here, first of all, are very high. I think they're very much overestimated. Uh, and even regardless, this is, in my opinion, the last place you want to mine for sand because the sand is within that area of the shore face from about the beach out to about 10 or 12 feet water depths. That's actually the active longshore transport system. So that sand is actually already within the beach nourishment system. It moves on and onshore and offshore during storms, and it moves alongshore during fair weather events. To take that sand is literally robbing from Peter to pay Paul. I mean, it, it, it serves no purpose. So I'm actually surprised that it's even been listed by some of these reports as being a viable resource. I might also point out that the, these slides at the bottom here, first of all, the maps here show our data set, the Rice University data set, cores that we've collected from the shore face, just to point out that we know what's out there. I mean, we have core, sediment cores, and those cores have sampled these sand mud deposits. And the two graphs that are figures at the bottom here, F labeled F and G, those are offshore transects of cores, sort of cross sections, if you will, of the shore face. Uh, based on these cores. In the case of Galveston, there is a reasonable thickness of sand, on, at least on the eastern half of the island, but most of that sand again resides in the more shallow uh, shore face. And if you mine that sand, not only are you robbing from Peter to pay Paul, but you're also steepening the shore face. That's increasing wave energy. Uh, so that's, uh, that's creating a situation where the shore face becomes unstable. In order to become stable again, it'll take sand from the beach and re equilibrate that profile. The slide on the right, this label GG prime, that's actually an offshore transect uh, from Bolivar. And what that shows is actually Bolivar is a pretty thin barrier. <laughs> Most of those cores, those red dots you see are cores. Virtually all those cores went through the barrier. And if some of you remember the days when they were actually mining sand pits on the barrier, those pits would go down about 10, 12 feet before they hit mud, before they hit bay mud. So Bolivar is not a particularly thick barrier. And uh, certainly as you go to the shore face, the shore face sands are quite restricted. They're quite thin. So we just simply, you know, cannot even think about mining sand from the shore face. That, that whole idea just needs to be discarded. So to kind of come back uh, full circle here, is there sand there? Yes, there is. There are sand bodies that have these you know, millions of cubic meter volumes. Uh, 
We have not done a lot of sampling of those sand bodies so that the quality of that sand, meaning the size, the amount of mud, uh, is not really well established. There is some data, but not enough to move forward with a project like this. The other point I would make is that it takes time to do these studies. Uh, one of the nice things that, well, one of the things I believe that's very positive here is that the general land office and the uh, bomb folks uh, have continued to fund projects to go out and look at these sand resources. But it takes time. Uh, my guess would be it'll probably be at least, you know, five years or more before we identify perhaps the first really large million sort of, uh, you know, sand source that's in the million cubic meter category. So we're a ways off. I think the advantage here, the point I always want to make is that some people might say, well, nourishing beaches is something we shouldn't be doing. We should not be protecting beachfront property. I would make a couple points here and then I'll shut up. And one is when we nourish beaches, first of all, it is known that the current rate of erosion along the Texas coast, I think it's pretty well established, is due to the fact that we have a shortage of sand, a sand supply, which is largely from offshore, has been depleted. And we have sea level rise that has increased fivefold in historical time. That's these are matters of fact. As we've also seen this year, we have increased frequency and magnitude of storms. So these things put together mean that we can expect to see even faster rates of coastal erosion in the future. I think we need to look at these resources regardless of whether we build a dike or you know, the, the, the proposed dune structure just to maintain our, our shoreline and the ecosystems that are and, and, and socioeconomic benefits of having our barrier island there. So I, I'm, I, I, I'm strongly in favor of beach nourishment, but we're talking about, in the case of the Corps of Engineers plan, the coastal spine, a huge amount of sand. And, and it's going to, again, it's going to take a lot of effort. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Um, we do have a one or two questions. Let's, I think, two questions for you that we'll do before we move on. Um, one, Susan Chadwick asks, if you have any idea what happens to the sand or sediment that's dredged out of local streams by the Harris County Flood Control District, um, she says they're unclear about that. Have, do you have any experience with that from your time working up there? Oh, you're muted. Sorry about that. Um, and, and I was, my, my phone's quit working, so I, I, I don't think I heard that first part of that question, but, but I certainly heard the last part. And, and again, I think when we're talking about these volumes, uh, the, the uh, sand resources that, that are more readily available, th this is not sand we're going to truck in from sand pits. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, the, the, these, we're talking very large quantities, so I think that it, it is without doubt that we're going to have to look for these sand volumes, these sand resources offshore. And again, given the fact that the shore face does not appear to be a viable source, we're going to have to go 20, 30 miles minimum to get that sand. That means using hopper dredges and that automatically significantly increases the cost of, of getting that sand. Sorry if I didn't answer the question, maybe you can. Um, well, it, she, she wanted to know, I think a little bit more specifically to sand or sediment that's dredged, I think up in Harris County by the Harris County Flood Control District. And I think yeah. if she, if you know what happens to that and, and I guess maybe what it's used for. Um, I, I don't, don't I, yeah, that's I don't, option here, but. Yeah, I don't know, but again, we're talking truckloads of sand. Yeah. 
and we need to be talking shiploads of sand. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, but but to answer your question, no, I do not know what what's done with that sand. And then we had another question from Ken Teague about um, mining on Ship Shoal, which is a, a, a sand bank off of the Louisiana coast. They did. Um, I have worked a little bit in projects that are near there, and they did mine that for some barrier island restoration. But there were a lot of oil and gas pipelines on that shoal, which posed a, cha a challenge for sand mining. And do you know if this has been looked at and is a consideration for these, the Sabine and Held banks, as well as the other uh, sand mining areas, borrow areas? Yeah, Sabine Bank does have a, uh, a pipeline crossing it. That has been taken into consideration in these engineering you know, uh, surveys looking at sand resources. Uh, so yes, that is taken into account when they're coming up with their volume estimates. They have a buffer zone on either side of that of those pipelines where where they would not be doing any dredging. So we have a couple other questions. Um, we have a question about the effects on fisheries, and we will actually get to that for the, the sand mining in the next slide. But um, we had another question about um, the, if the Mansfield Bank has been considered for beach renourishment for South Padre, or the, the Mansfield Bank was considered for beach renourishment for South Padre Island, but was rejected in the EIS due to loss of benthic population, um, but was, that was studied by now UTRGB. I'm not familiar with that, but, um, so I, I think that there's been a lot of studies. This actually that actually is kind of helpful. That's not that's more of a comment than a question. Yeah, well, but, I can I can say one thing about yeah. that, and that is when you get down to about Matagorda Island, we have what's called the Texas mud blanket, which is where you know most of the mud that comes a significant part of the mud comes out of the Mississippi River ends up here in Texas, and most of that sand ends up uh, in central and south Texas. So when we start talking about offshore sand resources from about Matagorda Island South, they're there, they're old deltas, they're old river valleys, but they're buried in tens of feet of mud. I mean, we're talking about 150 feet of mud that's accumulated in the last few thousand years, enormous amount of mud. So the central old South Texas shelf, there's just really not a lot of offshore sand resources. The Rio Grande Delta was certainly in its day a formidable feature. It's a huge body. There's lots of sand there. Uh, but there's been relatively little work done on the offshore Rio Grande Delta. The seismic data do suggest though, that there is sand by the time you get down to the uh, South Padre area offshore. And again, 20, 30 miles offshore. Good. Thank you very much. Um, it, just to go on to the next slide, and I'll let Joni talk a little bit also about turtles, because um, that is very much her area of expertise. But um, there have been studies that, primarily in Louisiana, that have looked more at the benthic community on sandy shoals um, and sandbanks such as this. And they have found differences in what, what the benthic community is, is like the worms and the invertebrates that live in the sediment. And so when you have sand compared to a surrounding muddy area, you have different worms and, and invertebrate species. And, and so that is what the fish eat. And so they are very important ecologically. They serve uh, as, as sort of hypoxia refuge. They're higher elevation in a lot of areas. And so they can actually provide refuge. So there is um, an enormous importance of these shoals and sand banks to, um, especially when they have, you know, a higher, a bathymetric uh, elevation difference from compared to surrounding areas. And so what would actually need to happen is that along with all the supplemental EISs that need to be done in this project, because none of the environmental impacts have been studied thoroughly, there would also need to be an environmental impact statement, like, like Dr. Anderson said, to look at the effects of just the mining in these areas, because they are important for fisheries. They are important um, prey species that live in the, in the sand. And so all of that still needs to be done. So many of these questions haven't been answered. Um, they're also used as foraging areas for 
comes endangered kemp's ridley sea turtles and i'll let joni add a little bit if she would like to talk more about that sure thank you so much can you hear me okay perfect thanks so um there are five species of sea turtles that are found in the gulf of mexico the critically endangered kemp's ridley is also our state sea turtle and what you're looking at in these images our turtles were tagged beginning back in 1997 back um, both on Texas and Mexico beaches. And so it was nesting females and they had satellite tags so they could monitor where they were moving in the Gulf of Mexico. And what you're seeing is that they use these near shore waters for foraging and from foraging to, um, from foraging grounds to nesting beaches. And so these turtles stay close to these shoals that Azura was just talking about. The, the bottom where there's prey ability and they, they use them as migratory pathways. And Dr. Anderson mentioned that two of the areas that they have identified were Sabine and Held's Bank, and those are circled in the red areas on the diagrams. And these are unique habitats, and they should be off limit. We should not be dredging these areas. The ecological impacts are highly unknown. We do not know what these hopper dredges would do to these banks. And as Azor just mentioned, they're very important. This benthic community is a very important food source for the fish population. And we know that turtles are caught in dredges. It happens. And so our Kemp's Ridley, a critically endangered turtle, is using this area where they're proposing to dredge for a sand source. And in addition to that, Dr. Anderson also mentioned that sand's important. We do beneficial nourishment projects to our beaches. But we also know that there's an economic impact while this work is going on. If you've been on Galveston while these, these nourishment projects were going on, there's large equipment on the beach, in the water, and even sometimes truckloads of sand being moved on our, on our roads throughout the island. So the economic impacts to the island and the peninsula from this long-term construction. Remember, they're proposing 19 and 26 miles of twin dunes. 12 and 14 foot high. So it would have a huge impact economically. And also there's been lots of amazing questions in the chat and the question, and thank you so much for asking them. Of course, we're concerned. You know, Dr. Anderson talked about where is this sand? Is it beach quality sand? How deep is it? Is there enough, possibly enough to build this massive dune system? And then also the other component, anybody that lives on the island or lives on Bolivar, and we just had three hurricanes. We didn't take a direct hit from any of them, but we experienced high tides and our dunes were devastated. We have property owners on the west end of Galveston are concerned, where is the GLO going to name the public beach line and the private beach line? So this system that they're proposing, it needs 185 feet for the twin dune system. And then in order to maintain it because of the, the tides that'll constantly be coming in, we need at least another 250 feet in front of it. So it's a tremendous amount of sand. It's gonna have a huge economic impact on the island and the peninsula while construction goes on. And the environmental impacts cannot be known. And as we've been saying over and over again, they have not been adequately studied. I don't know who's next, I'm sorry. Ezra, if you wanna advance it. Okay, sorry about that. My um, screen showing my how to unmute went away. So um, I am gonna go ahead and go over a comparison to other projects. So. We talked a lot earlier about non-structural protections and beach and dune, dune nourishment. Um, they've, they've been used all over the world. I mean, dune nourishment at a reasonable scale is a very doable thing. Um, beach beach renourishment, similarly. It has a cost, um, you know, financial costs and also costs to, um, you know, tourism and the ability to use that beach while it's undergoing, which is another reason to keep it at a, at a reasonable scale and not make it excessively huge. <laughs> Same with non-structural protection. So these are compared, you know, we can compare these aspects to projects that have been very successful all over the US and all over the world. But much of the gate design and engineering is taken from designs 
that were originally used in the Netherlands in the 1980s and 90s. And so we can look at those for comparisons to these other projects. And these were, for the most part, installed on narrow reinforced channels and not on open gulf inlets, such as the mouth of Galveston Bay. So one of these projects is the Maislon Barrier, which is um, on the, the shipping canal, shipping channel that goes into Rotterdam. Um, and so this was completed in 1997. It is a very, it's a sector gate. This was, um, you know, this was the design of the sector gates. This is, this is what they're based on. Um, there's one here. And you can see it is on a reinforced channel. It is not at the opening of this inlet. It's actually three miles from the opening of the inlet to the North Sea. So it's in a much more protected area than is being proposed for out at the, the opening of Galveston Bay. Um, and because of that, it's protected from these major hydrodynamic forcing. So the water, the energy of the, the waves and the surge and, and just, you know, uh, not just storm surge, but we, you know, enormous wave energy can, can occur from smaller storms. And all of that sediment movement and all of that sedimentation that occurs at the mouth of the bay, this, in the Netherlands, they built theirs further back where it was protected from this. And these gates would be built right out where all of that sediment movement is occurring, where um, possible deposition could, could fill in and fill in the gate. So it doesn't experience anything remotely close to the, the forcings of a major hurricane three miles inland from the North Sea. They don't get category five hurricanes. They have large storms, they have major storms. But um, so we look at somewhere where um, we do experience major storms. So it, next door in Louisiana, where they had the most, the worst, one of the worst hurricane seasons on record, I think they had that record for the number of hurricane strikes in one year. Um, they do experience large storms. And so they built, the U.S. Army Corps uh, has built a storm surge barrier. I've actually been in meetings with the Army Corps where they have compared this project on Galveston Bay to the Lake Bourne Surge Barrier, which is absurd if you know anything about the Lake Bourne Surge Barrier, because this is the city of New Orleans. This is the Lake Bourne Surge Barrier here. And it is, um, it goes across the Mr. Go. It deals with the, the flooding issue of that channel, which, which contributed enormously to the, the flooding and death during uh, Hurricane Katrina. Um, and was actually the responsibility of the U.S. Army Corps, who should have been properly uh, managing that canal. And so we can see that it's built here. It is not, if we zoom out, built here, where Lake Bourne um, opens up into Mississippi Sound and you you're opened up into major Gulf forcing. It's built much closer to the city of New Orleans, tied into the system of levees that protects the city, surrounded by wetlands and going across the channel closest to the thing that it needs to protect. It was not built here. And there's a reason for that. It's, this is not an efficient, realistic way to do it. Another barrier in the Netherlands, the Hartel barrier is what they used. I should have put a picture, it would have to bring us back. But if we think about those lift gates that were a hundred feet tall, um, that design is based on the Hartel barrier. And here is where the Hartel barrier is. Here's where that Maislant barrier is that I showed you previously. So the Hartel barrier is even further down this series of protected channels. And it's only two gates wide, not 15 gates wide, like what the Army Corps is proposing. What the Army Corps is doing is taking, you know, multiple gate systems that are used in very protected environments in the North Sea, which does experience major storms, but not category five hurricanes, and putting them together and then, you know, quadrupling them, quintupling them, many more so, and you know, building them at the mouth of Galveston Bay and saying that this will this this there won't be any problems with this, don't worry about it. And you know, I I, I think that this is just not a comparable project. I mean they're using these projects in Louisiana and in the Netherlands as examples, and they're not in any way comparable if you actually look at what these projects are and where they're built and the scale and size of them. So, concerns about the scale 
are based on the complexity and size of the project of the gate system that they're proposing. Um, they, they, it's just beyond anything that's really ever been built by the U.S. Army Corps or by anyone on the face of the earth. They're taking designs from the Netherlands. Netherlands, you know, has been shopping around this tech for decades. They've been trying to get Louisiana to build bigger and bigger gate systems. They've been trying to get New York State to build bigger and bigger gate systems. They've been trying to do this in Florida. They've been pushing this. But Texas is the only one that's that's gone this far because there's major, major concerns about these. And, you know, they need to be looked at in more detail. So concerns about operations and possible failure have been mentioned as we've gone through by um, the, the presenters and myself. Um, but on other projects of this size, you know, people who have been invited by the Army Corps to speak have talked about that things will happen with these kinds of structures. And I mean, that, that it goes without saying. Um, but we need to talk about what those are. We know things will go wrong. Uh, Mark Walraven, who is an advisor to the Dutch Infrastructure and Water Management Agency, presented and he talked about all the things that could go wrong and all the things that needed to be figured out and thought about beforehand. And even when you do that, you can't do every single eventuality, but you can do a better job of mit mitigating issues when you think through all of the potential problems. And Gate systems have been around, so we can do that. The Army Corps hasn't. And there was a question about whether or not the studies that we're asking for are beyond the capability of scientists. And they're not at all. They're not, there are numerous very valid scientific models of all the aspects of these environmental and engineering concerns that could be done. And the Army Corps has been asked to do that in official letters by numerous state and federal agencies, as well as conservation groups and individuals. And they have not done that. They say that they'll do them later and after we give them the money. So um, that, that's a major concern to me. I, we can't make the decision about whether or not this is an acceptable project without those studies being done. And they absolutely can be done. They, they just need to find the people that can do them. And right now they don't appear to have those people. So there's also navigation concerns. So the, with all this vessel traffic, this is the same type of thing. There's bound to be collisions. There will be collisions. There will be accidental collisions during a storm. Um, you know, barges hit bridges. Like it, it, it happens and it could be very devastating for these gates. So we need to think through these things. And so there's just so many what ifs. You know, what about inoperability after a storm? What if they couldn't be opened? This is, you know, and I don't think any of us on this panel have go completely gone through all almost 6,000 pages of all the supporting documentation, but you do have to go very deep to get any information. And so, you know, this is an appendix D on the engineering, which is a hundreds and hundreds of page long document that supports the hundreds of pages long report. And so um, this is where they talk about after an event, if one of these gates has a problem opening, there will still be one lane open for navigation until the other gate is able to open. And maybe that makes some people feel better, but it doesn't make me feel better. Because what is that gonna do to the environment of the bay? What is that gonna do to the water circulation and water quality and to the species that are moving in and out of the bay during that season in order to complete their life cycle and reproduce. What is that going to do to fisheries, you know, uh, fish recruitment and, and fisheries fish populations going forward? There's so many unknowns. And what if both gates get stuck? So this, it's not that much more likely that both could get stuck. There's only two. And so what if the sector gates can't open? But, or what if they can open, but the vertical gates can't because sediment has been deposited and pushed up against them and, and packed them in? How will they reopen them? If we're out without power for multiple weeks, will they have a power station that's hurricane proof? Uh, you know, what sort of generators will be able to power the hydraulics of the vertical lift gates? Will they have to come in on a, you know, on a barge or on a ship? 
And will that even be possible? We don't, you know, we don't really know the answers to these questions. So I, I think, you know, I think everyone here knows that we need flood protection in this area. We've had too many devastating floods from, from hurricanes of all types, but we need it now and we need it in a reasonable way that protects people as quickly as possible and not in 20 years. And so we need to move up all these smaller scale projects that can be studied and built sooner because these will provide protection to more frequent smaller storms and, and rain events that cause flooding all the time. I mean, the city of Galveston floods multiple times a year downtown. I mean, there's, there's flooding, there's improvements that we need right away. And so I don't know if the, the way these projects are planned in the Army Corps proposal is the best way to do it, but we, we need to look at them individually in each community. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Jordan and um, she's gonna go through some of the recommendations that, that we wanna hopefully see looked at. Thank you. Awesome, thanks so much, Azure. And thank you all for sticking with us. Um, we know that this is, this is a dense conversation and really appreciate um, all the fantastic questions that y'all are asking in both the chat and the Q&A. Um, just so you know, we are coming to, to a close with our formal presentation and y'all have been great about answering, uh, asking questions. But if you do have additional questions, please uh, fill them in the chat and we will, we will answer them as we can. But you know, as we've outlined tonight, protecting our communities is, is critical, but we can't rely or wait on a silver bullet solution that will take decades to build and can cause significant risk and harm to the Bay. Given the complexity of hurricane risk um, that's compounded with the challenges and the joy of living on the Gulf Coast, um, the reality is there's no one solution that's gonna protect all of us from the risks of hurricanes. So we need projects that are gonna be, that are gonna provide tailored solutions, community to community, and provide multiple levels of defense. So, you know, many of y'all have participated in some of these forums that we've hosted in the past, um, seen, uh, communication that we've given to the press and um, directly with with some of y'all about what we think should be done and you know this has been kind of outlined throughout the presentation but just one more time um, you know what what we think the the best solutions are and the best recommendations to really start addressing our hurricane storm risk storm surge risk flood risk wind risk um, is elevating homes out of harm's way um, surge, flood, and windproofing buildings and infrastructure along the bay and across um, our barrier islands, nourishing our beaches and dunes in a sustainable way, improving drainage and flood protections on Galveston Island, and then importantly, restoring our wetlands, oyster reefs, building out loving shorelines that reduce the kinetic, the kinetic energy of tides and surge and helps reduce erosion so that we are maintaining these natural spaces that are, are housing us and are also providing the, the ecosystem and home to all the wonderful natural benefits that we have by living on the Gulf Coast and in here in Texas, on the upper Texas coast. And you know, after Hurricane Ike, uh, I think a really good example that has been pointed to today and um, in other times as well, Bolivar residents built back um, in a way that made them much more resilient to hurricane impacts. And they provide an important model for our coastal communities. And that's by providing direct investments into communities to residents to secure homes and buildings from surge, wind, and flood risk. These, you know, our, our problems here on the Texas Gulf Coast are not just with surge. The, the hurricanes that we've seen, even just this last season, the biggest risks have been from wind and flood, not from not as much from surge. And these could these kind of solutions, these kind of um, smaller scaled implementations, could provide much more immediate protection to communities than a massive surge gate and surge wall that will take 15 to 20 years to construct. Additionally, we do need a more in-depth study to determine. Um, if the risk to industrial facilities in the ship channel can be mitigated with targeted industry-funded interventions. 
Um, we know that some of the tanks and facilities are much riskier than others. And we would call on Harris County to appoint a task force to oversee this effort of studying, studying this immediately. There's no reason to allow a few facilities to present a large risk to our ecosystem and to our residents um, while we're trying to pursue, pursue these broader coastal protections. And finally, industry first and foremost should be responsible for their own protection. If any facility is at risk from storm surge or any other hurricane impacts, they should be responsible for their investments and making, making those investments to um, improve, improve their security. And again, you know, at the end of the day, no one project, no silver bullet is gonna protect everyone from hurricane risk and that includes storm surge. But by investing in community driven projects that provide necessary protections along Galveston Bay, um, down to the Gal Galveston Island, Bala Peninsula, um, and including restoring our natural systems, like our wetlands, beaches, and oyster reefs, we can start providing protections now, not 15 years down the road when conditions will have certainly changed um, and construction costs will have increased. Um, next slide, Azure. So what can you do? Um, we are in the comment period now. Um, and as Azure has mentioned, as others have mentioned here today, um, this is a incredible study. This is lengthy, it's over 600 pages long. It's a lot to take in, um, especially in our minimum 45 days. And so we would ask all of you tonight to visit this link um, that you see here on the page and help us ask for an extension um, until February 1st of next year. That would give us an, a, a full uh, 90 days to review this project while not including holiday, the holidays that are coming up, which you know, I think is, is really not very fair of the core to consider our holidays, especially given the tough time that we are all having right now of trying to take as much time with, with family what, in whatever way that that looks like to be reading over a very lengthy technical you know, honestly boring, but critically important document um, during that special time. So help us call, call on the core to um, get this extension till February 1st. What's special about this link is that it will not only be asking the core directly, but we'll be asking all of, all of your elected officials um, from our federal representatives to our state representatives. And this is a really important opportunity to, to get that extension and allow all of us more time to comment on these really important elements within the Coastal Barrier Project. So you can visit all these links, download and review the documents. Um, we'll be sending this out um, in an email to everyone who attended and registered for this event. Um, feel free to pass that on to your friends, neighbors, neighborhood associations, churches, community groups, spread this far and wide and get people in touch. Let them know what's going on with this project. This video, um, this recording will also be shared with you so you can watch it again. Um, you know, I know it's lengthy, it's very dense, but we'll hopefully provide you with some additional information and good talking points as, we're moving, as you're moving forward with providing your own comments. Um, and as of right now, the comment deadline hasn't moved. So submitting your public comments by December 14th. And those can be submitted at virtual meet public meetings um, or by email or by phone or by mail. Um, so I just wanna note that there are two remaining formal public comment meetings that are coming up. It's Thursday, December 3rd and December, uh, Tuesday, December 8th. There's one in the, in the late morning and again, another one in the evening. Next slide. So just a, a quick primer on some, you know, and again, you'll get this in your email, um, but some best things, uh, some kind of best practices around submitting comments. All of the questions that you asked us tonight are questions that you should be posing to the core. They can be something that is a heartfelt story for you of why the Bay is important and you feel that this project is not 
meeting the the promises that they have said are going to um, that they're going to provide with the with the coastal barrier project the concerns that you have will this affect fit will this affect you know my ability to go catch flounder with will this affect my ability to get um, shrimp when um, on my shrimp boat or from the local shrimper that I you know get at my farmers market or down on the bay um, you know, asking these questions and just provi providing any opportunity for comment. Um, these are all things that the Corps will have to address. They are required by law to answer these questions in their response to comments um, once the public comment period is open, uh, over. So no question is, um, is irrelevant. Every question is important. And we, we hope that you will ask them and raise the concerns that you've brought to us today. Um, again, the public meeting will be online and the official, so it's important to note that they are having a couple of other meetings that are quote, question and answer periods, kind of like what we're doing today. Those are not formal comment periods. So be aware that any question and any answer that they give at those meetings will not be put into the formal public record. To have any comment put into the formal record, you have to submit them online, submit them in the mail, submit them through a letter, um, or submit them at these virtual public comment periods. And in those, you are welcome and encouraged to ask questions, but just know that the Army Corps representatives will not be able to answer them at those meetings. So comments, when you're giving them at these virtual meetings, can be time, uh, maybe time limited, anywhere from two to three minutes. Though in previous meetings, and you know, I think it's on them, these meetings weren't highly publicized. Um, there haven't been a whole lot of participants, so they haven't been cutting people off on time. But I think, you know, I hope that you'll attend these meetings in December, help flood these meetings, let them know that people are concerned and want to know more, you know, about what the core is doing and what they're not doing within this process and um, to make this project better and to do away with the elements of the project that we don't want for the upper Texas coast. So I, I will close it out there. Um, and it looks like we may have a couple of other questions. Oh, one last slide. Thank you, Azure. So this is a list that you'll be getting in your email with all the contact information for your elected officials. So this, we will send this around. Um, it will come with, uh, with all the documents that you've seen this evening so that you can reach out to them directly and let them know your thoughts. It is as important in a lot of ways because the next step is congressional appropriation for this project. The next most important step is to let your elected official know that how you feel about this project, whether you want it or not, or you know what elements of the project that you do want and what you think are problematic. So let the core know what you think. That's critically important, but it's also just as important to let your elected officials know what you think about this project because they're the ones that are going to be pursuing the funding for the Texas match as well as for the congressional funds as well. So I'm, I'm gonna close it out here and thank y'all so much for, for being involved. I invite all the other panelists to, to come back on screen. Um, thank you all for, for being here tonight. What a wonderful array of experts and passionate individuals who live here on the Gulf Coast here in Texas. Um, and please feel free to reach out to any of us. I'll be in, in an email that you'll receive from me first thing tomorrow morning. We'll have all of our contact information if you have any follow-up questions that you have for us and ways to, and ways to reach out and be involved. Thank you very much, Jordan. And thank you, everybody. Um, thank you, all the participants. Um, do we want it? I know we've gone very long and I have, a large part of the responsibility for that. Um, but um, if, if people want to stick around a little bit, there are a uh, one question I saw pop up and we could maybe take a couple more if everybody's okay with that. Um, do, you, do you want to just do a couple? Uh, it was, it is a, an important clarification that we didn't make. Um, Janine Perot asks about an alternative proposed system of of islands that could act as baffles during the storm with recreation and nature sanctuaries and if we've heard of that and i i'm assuming that i think what you're thinking of is the speed center plan from rice university and so what they proposed was using um dredge sediment from the upper part of the houston ship channel to actually build islands closer to in the in the northwestern part of galveston bay 
And so it would protect those communities, Seabrook um, and Kima and LaPorte and those areas from surge and they would actually have gates within that. And so that is, a, is another plan. It is not associated with the Army Corps plan. It is, it's been proposed by the Speed Center. They, um, they have not gone through, um, the, the, it has not gone into a study process yet. So it's sort of a conceptual design at this point, but there are other ideas. And I think the most important thing that that shows is that we're not stuck with only what the Army Corps has laid out. There are a lot of ways to improve coastal protection in our area. And the Army Corps is a very narrow view of that. And so we need to look at a lot of other plans. Yeah, and they call that one the Galveston Bay Park Plan. Um, and just to let you know, Galveston Bay Foundation is, and, and the other folks in, on the panel have uh, been hearing about that one for a while, but as Azure said, it's not to a steady phase yet. But there's, we certainly have concerns about that from direct and indirect impacts. And there's particularly some potential impacts to dolphins that may be caught in the more fresher uh, fresh water body that would be created upstream of that uh, island system, and then potential impacts to oysters um, to the south of it that may be starved for fresh water. So there's some potential problems. There's potential problems with any big structural solution, and that's why we need to really start getting moving on the non-structural and some of the natural methods and some sustainable methods. I think that's it. Do you see any other questions that got it on? Okay, that's that's just the last one I wanted to get to. So I think we're all good. I know. I wanted to extend my appreciation to everyone that had attended as well. It was a long two hours and lots of information. And you know, please again, just comment, comment, comment. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Thank you all so much. Really appreciate your participation. Mm -hmm. Same here from me. Appreciate your uh, participation. Thanks everyone. You'll be hearing from us um, very soon and we'll be in touch. And again, feel free to reach out to any of us while you'll have all of our contact information all in one place um, in your inboxes tomorrow. So thank you all. Have a wonderful night and enjoy, uh, enjoy your evening. Thank you. Good night, Good night. Thanks. Good night. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.